and most of the commanders were elderly Revolutionary War veterans. So our army was in horrible shape. We only had about 7,000 soldiers in service, and most of their commanders were elderly Revolutionary War veterans. And President Madison, number three, made a big mistake. What do you have to do to have a successful army? You got to have organization organizations and command and what do you do what's the first thing you do when you get ready you appoint one person to be the overall commander of those forces and Madison failed to do that so President Madison failed to appoint an overall commander to direct the war effort which left American troops poorly trained and equipped okay you gotta have one person the buck stops here right you gotta have one person Mr. Sanford is the overall commander of this of the high school's principal if you didn't have an overall commander, I have my own opinions. Mrs. Wiley has her own opinions. You know, uh, you know, Mrs. Bilodeau has her own opinions. Mr. Riedel has his own opinions. Do you ever get anything done if you don't have an overall commander or someone that's overall, gonna, you know, where the buck stops? No. And that's what happened. Well, this is kind of interesting. Back in Great Britain, Parliament really isn't interested in beating the Americans and taking the colonies back. That's not their goal. What they want to do in the War of 1812 is to ensure that the United States never again would declare war on their country. They were going to teach them a lesson. So it wasn't a war of, we're going to kick your butt and take you back. We don't, we don't want you. Frankly, you're a waste of our time. But by God, we're going to make sure that we give you a lesson so you never declare war on us again. So. Back in Great Britain, Parliament was not interested in securing the American colonies back. They wanted to ensure that the United States never again would declare war on their country. Now, the British believed that a victory over the Americans in the War of 1812 would leave the United States of America at Britain's mercy forever. They would dictate to them on trade, they would dictate to them on prices, foreign policy. We're going to kick their butt and dominate them forever. They will never ever consider themselves as powerful as, as Britain. So again, when I ask you in the test, what was the goal of the British in the War of 1812? It wasn't to secure the American colonies back. It was to ensure that the United States of America would never ever again declare war on them and that a victory over the Americans would leave America at their mercy forever. Okay, it doesn't start out real good for us. That'll take us to our next subtopic, which is early disasters at the nation's capital. Early disasters. Did anybody know anything about, the, anything about this story? Well not, well, not exactly, but you're close. You're close. In August of 1814, just six miles from Washington, D.C., approximately 30,000 British redcoats engaged American military and militia forces. In August, in August of 1814, six miles from Washington, D.C., approximately 30,000 British redcoats engaged American military and militia forces. We didn't even have enough army to fight them on our own. We had to use militia as well. Well, what these British soldiers were doing is they were marching toward an unguarded capital. Washington was not being defended. So these 30,000 British redcoats were marching toward an unguarded capital. The residents of Washington were so sure they were going to be overrun, they evacuated the city. How many soldiers do the Americans have? How many do they have? Chances are not too good. And people in Washington can see that the capital is unguarded and they begin to evacuate the city. And they were right because the American military and militia that were fighting six miles outside of Washington, D.C. against these 30,000 British redcoats were soon overrun. Soon overrun. 
and British soldiers pour into Washington, D.C., and they destroy, as Sully said, several public buildings. Now, they compare this act of terrorism by the British against the United States in August of 1814 to the events that we know recently as 9-11. That was kind of what our surprise, the British would come over and attack us like this. At least they considered it terrorism. Now, one of the new weapons the British had that was pretty, pretty perfective was the Congreve rocket. Congreve rocket. And this was basically a modern day pipe bomb on a stick of bamboo. A modern day pipe bomb on a stick of bamboo. What I'm giving, what I'm giving you now is a picture of a Congreve rocket that I took in the National History Museum, American History Museum last year when we were in D.C. Always wanted to see one, never really had a chance to see one, and they had one there. You got an extra one or you need one more? Matter of fact, I took this picture illegally, I hate to admit that to you, <laughs> because you're not supposed to take pictures of certain things in the American History Museum, and I would be upset if you guys didn't follow the rules, but the only way you get a picture of a concrete rocket is if I took that picture. So there you go. That's what. It, see what that looks like? Basically a pipe bomb on a stick of bamboo. Well, this rocket was the brainchild of Sir William Congreve, who got the idea from such weapons that were used in India. So this rocket was the brainchild of Sir William Congreve. And he got this idea back in 1799 when he witnessed the use of this type of weapon in India. Now if you look at that photograph I just gave you, the Congreve rocket was made from iron tubes and you see that conical nose on the top, the shape of a cone, and they would weigh anywhere from 3 pounds to 32 pounds in weight. So they were different sizes. I'm not sure what this one here would have weighed. You can kind of get an idea. I had that little guy stand there so I could get kind of an idea of the size of that. Now, the range of these rockets, how far they would go, was about a thousand yards, and they would explode upon contact. So you would shoot them off and they'd fly as much as a thousand yards, and you would shoot them into a building or a fort or whatever. That's the idea, the concrete rocket. Now, the main use of the Congreve rocket in the War of 1812 wasn't to blow anything up, but was basically to start fires and raise havoc. Okay, it's not like it's going to blow up and, you know, blow a building apart. Basically, they were used to start fires and raise havoc. Well, with these weapons, these Congreve rockets and ground troops on the ground, the unfinished Capitol building and the Treasury building were both set on fire by these British soldiers. So they march into Washington, D.C., they use Congreve rockets, and they start the unfinished Capitol building, wasn't quite done yet, and the Treasury building on fire. Now, another building that was lit on fire, not by the Congreve rocket, was the Library of Congress. And how'd they start that thing on fire? Come on! They started the Library of Congress on fire. How'd they start on fire? What? With what? What'd they burn up? The books. They used the books in the Library of Congress to fuel that fire. And now getting to Sully's point, the British soldiers also in, invaded the White House. And they took control, and they actually sat down and enjoyed a meal for 40 people that was originally set up by First Lady Dolly Madison, who was expecting guests. So when they fled the White House, they left the food there, and these British soldiers invaded the White House, 
took control, sat down and enjoyed a very nice meal for 40 people that was originally set up by First Lady Dolly Madison for some guests he had coming. And Sully had it right because after feeding themselves on Mrs. Madison's meal, the Redcoats ransacked the White House and set it on fire, and by the end of this siege, only a shell of the president's home was visible. So almost burnt the thing, burnt the thing for sure inside. And all you could see was kind of a shell of the White House when they got down. So the British soldiers set fire to the Capitol, they set fire to the Treasury Building, they used the books in the Library of Congress to set fire to that. They invade the White House, they take control, they sit down and enjoy a meal for 40 people that First Lady Dolly Madison had set up for guests. After feeding themselves, they might ransack the White House and set it on fire, and by the end of this siege, only a shell of the President's home was visible. And in and around D.C., several and sig several significant buildings were reduced to smoking rubble. Absolutely reduced to smoking rubble. So we did not do well early in the War of 1812. Now, when I take you to D.C. and we have a tour of the Capitol, you can still see the burn marks from 1812 in the Capitol. And you can see bullet nicks, you know, not, not holes, but where bullets hit also. And they'll show you that. When you go in the White House, if you get into certain areas, you can still see some of that. Okay, so anyway, it was quite a thing. Okay, now, this is important. This is the British assault on Baltimore. Baltimore, Maryland, which is going to lead to what? Eventually, the Star Spangled Banner. So the British assault on Baltimore. Well, the British plan was to assault Washington, D.C., then take Baltimore, then Philadelphia, then New York City, and put the American government totally in chaos. That was their plan. They were going to hit Washington, D.C., then they were going to Baltimore, then they were going to Philadelphia, and then they were going to New York City, and they were going to raise havoc in all of those cities and put the American government in havoc. Because their goal isn't to possess the American states, their goal is to raise havoc and ensure that they never, ever, ever declare war on them again. They're going to teach them a lesson. Well, civilians back in Baltimore prepare for this British invasion. They know they're coming. And here's some things they did to prepare for this British attack. First of all, they dug defensive trenches on the town's perimeter. And you know what a defensive trench is, right? They dug a trench so they could get behind those trenches and protect the city. So they dug defensive trenches on the town's perimeter. What else would you want? You wouldn't want British ships to come into the ports around Baltimore, so what would you do? You would barricade all ports around the city. You would barricade all ports around the city. You would not want British vessels coming into your ports. And they stationed about 700 militia on the outskirts of town to protect them the best they could. Okay? They stationed approximately 700 militia on the outskirts of town. Now, if the British are going to capture Baltimore, they're going to have to secure a protective garrison in Baltimore Harbor, Fort McKendry. So the only way they get into Baltimore, if they want to capture Baltimore, is they're going to have to secure and take over a protective garrison in Baltimore Harbor known as Fort McKendry. If they capture Fort McKendry in Baltimore Harbor, they march into town, and it's all over but the shouting. Okay? So Fort McKendry. Now Fort McKendry, if you're wondering about the spelling, is M small c capital H E N R Y. Fort McKendry. 
Now, the commander at Fort McHenry is Major George Armistead. The commander at Fort McHenry, Fort McHenry is Major George Armistead. And he's got a plan for the British. He knows they're coming. He's thought this through and he's got a plan. So the commander at Fort McHenry is Major George Armistead and he has a plan for the British. Now this is kind of interesting. Knowing the British are coming, he ordered a new American flag for the garrison in Baltimore Harbor. He ordered a brand new flag. And he wanted this flag as large as possible so the British could see it. And the bigger the flag, the bigger the act of defiance. Take a look at this ginormous flag we got posted at Fort McHenry. That's how much chance you have of taking this fort. Come get us. It was an act of defiance. This flag was 42 feet by 30 feet. That's a big flag. 42 feet by 30 feet is this flag that Armistead ordered for Fort McHenry knowing the British was coming. He knew the British would be attacking the fort and the large flag was intended to be an act of defiance by the Americans. Okay, that's going to take us to events at Fort McHenry and British retreat. Events at Fort McHenry and British retreat. Now on September 12th of 1814, British ships of war approached the ports of Baltimore with Fort McHenry in their target. They're coming at them. They're coming at them. On September 12th of 1814, British ships of war approached the ports of Baltimore and they've got Fort McHenry in their sights. Now the British had eight bombing vessels in their entire navy. Eight. They sent five of those to Baltimore. That's how serious they were about taking this fort and this city. In their entire arsenal, they had eight bombing vessels. And they sent five of the eight to Baltimore, showing their seriousness to take the city. This is how we're going to finish the day by telling you this little story. On one of these five bombing ships was an American lawyer by the name of Francis Scott Key. On one of these British bombing vessels was an American lawyer by the name of Francis Scott Key. Now you might be saying, what in the world is an American lawyer, Francis Scott Key, doing on one of these bombing ships headed for Baltimore? Well, he was there trying to negotiate the release of one of his clients that was being held on that ship in the fleet. He was only on the ship to try to release one of his clients who the British had accused of something and were holding them on their ship. Now this was an American, okay? So Francis Scott Key is simply traveling with the British trying to negotiate the release of one of its clients that's being held on a ship in the fleet. <laughs> well, as these ships are sailing towards Baltimore's harbors, Francis Scott Key convinces the British commander, Robert Ross, to release his client after showing him evidence of his innocence. So Francis Scott Key is a lawyer. He's on the ship to try to get one of his clients free. He prevents evidence, presents evidence to the British commander Robert Ross, and Ross agrees to release his client. But he's not going to let either man off the ship 
until Baltimore is secured by the British. So Francis Scott Key is a hostage, so to speak, along with his client on this British bombing vessel. Although they're free to go, so to speak, Ross isn't going to let him go until after Baltimore is secured. Once the city is taken by the British, he will release both men. Now, tomorrow, and you can start the, writing this down so you're ready, we're going to tell you what the British strategy was at Baltimore, what they were going to do to take the city. And we'll tell you a little bit about Fort, Fort McHenry, what was there, etc. But just understand that Francis Scott Key is on that British ship trying to negotiate the release of one of his clients. He negotiates the release, but they're not going to let either man off that ship. So he's going to be on one of those bombing vessels witnessing this assault on Fort McKinley. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, it's, great. it's a great story. Okay, so just to understand where Francis Scott Key is in this situation. Yes, dear. So you said that it was due Wednesday, November 17th, but the 17th is a Friday. It is? 